This weekend marks the 45th anniversary of the invasion of Cyprus by Turkey in 1974, and we just uh, prayed for the souls of those who were massacred and those who fought and fell during that time. And I wanted to just give you my own witness of what happened because I was there. I was uh, 17 years old. I was not yet uh, drafted in the military because I was still in high school. But I was there and I volunteered and I went to the front line and I experienced the full blast of the Turkish attack. Um, while the town, the village where we lived, was uh, bombarded continually with rockets, with bombs, with F-16s, for three days. And um, they were just, they had no mercy. They had no mercy. This is a small little island with no army, with no planes, with no tanks, with a very tiny little National Guard and one of the biggest armies in the world next to the United States invaded it and pounded it. The invasion actually started yesterday. It was the Feast of Prophetess Elias and we have the icon of Prophet Elias here. In the town where I grew up, the church where I grew up was dedicated to Prophetess Elias. So it was our feast day. It was the feast of our church. But very early in the morning, before the sun rose, we got word that the Turks were unloading troops on the northern coast of Cyprus. And then soon after, the planes started coming, um, dropping um, soldiers and materials and weapons in the towns and villages where there was a population, a Turkish population. And of course, soon after that, there was mayhem everywhere. As I said, I was 17, but I volunteered and went with a group of soldiers to the front line where the battles began to be fought. And for the next three days, I was there until the Turks declared ceasefire And then, of course, during the ceasefire for the next three weeks, they were unloading more troops and tanks so that they can do the second round of the invasion, which basically took the northern part of the island and forced us out of our homes. About 200,000 people were forced out of our homes. And then we found out what happened after we returned several years later, like 30 years later, they let us go back to see what they had done. Let me just tell you about the first three days, though, because that was one of the most difficult and most amazing, um, amazingly dangerous times in my life. When um, we're at the front line where there is exchange of fire and the, the group that I was with was about 28 people, and the, and the purpose of it was to basically mislead the Turks, divert them, to attack us so that the regular troops will come from another direction. And the first day, <clears throat> we were shelled, we were, we were bombed, we were, and we were in the fields. And the, the Turkish um, guards and the Turkish troops were just uh, about 500 yards away. And that night, I was, I was 17, I was never trained in the military, but I was asked to keep guard, so they gave me um, a hunting gun, a shotgun. I had shot the hunting gun before, so I knew how to use it. And um, there was no place to hide, there was no place to, it was just, you're in the fields. Okay, so I said, stand here and just watch. If you see anything, let us know. We can, we can call the others and see what we can do. So here I was at between two and four in the morning, having had hardly slept. Well, I did try to sleep before I went, uh, I went on guard. I tried to sleep on the ground. 
in the field that had been plowed. So there was a lot of stones, a lot of big rocks, and a lot of all kinds of things. I couldn't put my body anywhere to find comfort. But I took a stone and put it under my head. So I was able to kind of catch a quick nap, 15 minutes, I'm not sure how it was. And then they woke me up and they said, it's time for you uh, to stand guard. So I took the, uh, the shotgun and stood, stood there. Actually, I sat, but I watched. It was dark. It was absolutely dark. There was no, there was no uh, stars in the sky. There, were, there, were no, um, there was no uh, moon that night. It was a very dark night, which reflected what was happening. And then the next day, again, the shelling started. The F-16s coming and shooting at us and then bombing the village, our, our village, and then leaving, making turns and doing it again. Um, you know, Turkey is only 40 miles away, so they would take off from Turkey. They would come in and shell us and shoot us and bomb us and then go back. And of course, we had no way to respond to them because we had no anti-aircraft guns. We had no um, shelters to hide. We, had, we were just in the fields. Let me go back. And then the third day, the same thing, the same thing. And then finally, we were able to actually get into the military installation that the Turks had right uh, ahead of us. Uh, right before the ceasefire was declared. And then what happened is that the Turkish troops had withdrawn into the mountains because they, were, they didn't want to lose anybody or they didn't want to lose any more people, perhaps, if they had lost any. And what happened is that they left everything behind, but they took all their people, they took all their machine guns, all their weapons, everything that they had, and they moved into the mountains, waiting for the time when it was opportune to them so they can come back. And that's what they did three weeks later. Let me go back to the 20th, the feast of our church, Prophetess Elias, every year. There will be a major feast. When we say feast, we mean thousands of people will come from all over. There will be um, booths selling things, just like the Greek festival here, but not exactly the same and not for raising money. It was just people coming to purchase things uh, from these booths that were uh, all over the place. And uh, thousands of people will gather, and the liturgy will be magnificent, and there will be a major um, uh, procession outside the church with the icon, the miraculous icon of Prophetus Elias that we had, which was covered in silver, and it had a depiction of him rising into heaven. That icon was very important to us because Prophetus Elias, Prophet Elijah, he is the saint who closed the heavens and no rain came down for three and a half years. If you remember the story from the Old Testament, he is the same one who eventually called fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice that he had set in front of God after the priests, 300, 450 priests of Baal, prayed for hours for the whole day and they couldn't do anything. He said to them, just, it's my turn now, give me a moment. And within a few minutes, fire came from heaven with his prayers and consumed the entire thing um, right in front of everybody. The power of Prophetus Elias is amazing. The gifts that God gave him were amazing. And then after that, he prayed that rain will come down and rain came back to the people again. So, living in Cyprus in a very dry place, actually, in the plains of Cyprus, which were the farming, the farming land. And been hit by droughts year after year. I remember my parents praying for rain, so every time it rains here, I am delighted. I have so much joy when it rains. Some of you may be crying and saying, no more rain. I say, yes, give us rain. Wash our sins. Uh, water the plants. Do whatever it is. Get the dust out of the air and the pollen. We didn't have any pollen there, but here we do. So, here we are on the greatest feast of our town and the greatest panigiri, the greatest um, celebration that we would ever see every year. And that day, everything was dead. 
because as soon as the morning broke, the, lit the liturgy had begun, the orthros had begun, but the Turkish uh, planes were flying over us, and I was given the responsibility to run to the priest and tell him to stop the service because the Turks were coming. And I did, and that had remained in my mind and my heart forever. I interrupted the liturgy that day, so I vowed that I will never miss the liturgy of Prophetus Elias in my life after that. So I was here yesterday. We had a few people. I'm glad that you're here today to tell you the story. The liturgy was interrupted, and that church eventually was terribly bombed, shelled, the dome fell in, destroyed. It was bigger than our church here. It was all with limestone, uh, not limestone, but afropetra, um, uh, sandstone. Yeah. And it was a hundred years old. And it had some beautiful um, older iconography on the walls, but not very much and a beautiful um, iconostasio, which went all the way to the roof, filled with icons from top to bottom. And I went back, and I tried to get in in 2004, and went back again in 2010 with a group from here. Some of you who are with me remember those moments. The church is destroyed. The church where I was baptized, where I grew up, where I felt the presence of God so many times as a child, as a teenager, as that's where I learned how to chant and, and hymn God. That's where I learned how the liturgy is done. That's how I learned how the sacraments are done. I might have gone to the seminary in Boston, but I knew already because I had gone to all the services for 17 years growing up in Cyprus. And now it lies ruined, destroyed. The reports we got, they were after we left, we ran off on the 14th of, of uh, August as the Turkish tanks were coming in and shelling the town. We ran off to save our lives, basically. And a few people stayed behind, about 15, 20 people, and they told us the icons were taken off the Iconostasio and thrown into the streets. Um, anything that had any value was stolen. The miraculous icon of Prophetus Elias was thrown into the streets. It was used um, to create a table so they can play cards on it. The Turks were playing cards on the icon. So the desecration and the um, dis disrespect that was shown is tremendous. The cemetery about half a mile away, a quarter of a mile away, all the crosses were broken, brought and thrown into a pile. If you go there, you won't even know it's a cemetery unless you see the crosses broken. The grave of my grandfather, who was a priest, and the other priests that were buried in the same grave, desecrated, broken, and kicked into the ground. I can talk about this for a long time. I don't want to make you feel too bad and make you sad. It's just that I want to convey a reality which is so removed from our reality here. And we assume that everything is good in the world. We hear some news, but it's far away. It doesn't matter. Uh, we hear about people being killed. We heard about Syria, what they did in Syria. We heard about Egypt, what they did in Egypt. We heard about the uh, beheading of those 18 or 28 Egyptian, 28, 22. 22 Egyptian young men. You find that video online if you want. Uh, they did the same thing to us in 1974. If, I think, the, power, the powers of the world, the powerful people of the world had stopped them at that time, they would have probably been able to stop them at every time. But they didn't care at that time, therefore they don't care now. I don't think it's all just fluff. Cyprus is still under Turkey. Our churches being destroyed are still being destroyed. They're rotting away after being looted, 
after being turned into um, stables for animals, after the cross has been removed, after the icons be thrown, ah, the, the more expensive icons were taken and uh, sold into Europe. And some of them came to America. So we've been recovering them over the years. Even mosaic, um, mosaic icons that are in the ancient churches from the early Byzantine period, they were removed um, by specialists, by people who actually knew what they were doing. And they were saved and sold to Europe. And one of them was found in um, Texas, it was? Texas, I believe. And some family had bought it, and then the Church of Cyprus claimed it. And we finally had it after it stayed there for many years in their museum. Then they returned it back to the Church of Cyprus. Things like this. And these are the things that we can see. Let me tell you some of the things that we couldn't see. The Turkish troops took uh, many soldiers, our soldiers, the Cypriot, Greek Cypriot soldiers, they took them as hostages. They took them as, um, they took them to Turkey. The descriptions, and, and they, let, they let a lot of them come back. We're still missing a thousand people after we had about a thousand of them discovered they were buried in mass graves or here and there. We're still missing a thousand people. We don't know where they are. We don't know if they died, where they are. But we had several thousand that were taken to Turkey, primarily soldiers, but also young men that were no soldiers, people like me. They had caught me at the time. Uh, they have either just shot me in the fields or taken me to Turkey um, as a hostage, as a prisoner of war. A lot of those guys were turned back, were given back in exchange with Turkish prisoners of war. And I can tell you several cases that I know, they were changed forever. They came back after being beaten daily, being hungry and thirsty, uh, being encouraged to drink their urine and eat their feces, uh, fighting with throwing, they would have them in a cage basically and would throw a piece of bread to them and they were all hungry for three or four days and they would watch them fight for that piece of bread and they would laugh at them. So those young men came back, they were never the same again and they were never healthy again. In fact, I know several of them that died by the time they were 30 because of depression, because of... Um, whatever the effects of that imprisonment were. So we're talking about barbarians still behaving like barbarians after thousands of years of encountering civilization, after having destroyed the Roman, Christian Roman civilization, they are still behaving as barbarians, and we are friends with them. And that's the sad part for me. We're trying to be friends with them. That's my story. There's a lot more to it. I just don't want to keep you too long. That's my story. Some, someone, I was, I was in Cyprus for eight years, as you know, as a priest. And uh, one day, I, uh, we read the gospel about um, forgiving our enemies. And um, I preached about it, and I talked about it, and I said that we need to forgive even those who harm us. And this is a church full of people who were affected by the war, a lot of them who are refugees from the northern part, never been able to return to their homes. Some of them lost children or spouses or... And um, the chanter, my chanter, will always raise his hand at this point. And he will say, Father, how can we forgive the Turks? Tough question. How can you forgive somebody that has done so much to you, so much bad to you, so much evil to you? And not only to you, but to everybody around you, everybody that you know. That's a good question. How can you do that? Well, a little bit of the answer is given, was given to me very early in that process. Soon after we left our homes and we were 
in the southern part of Cyprus. And the first Saturday, well, okay, I was with, a, with a hundreds of refugees and my parents and my siblings, and, and there was one woman that stood out in the, in the group. She was encouraging others. She was saying, don't worry, God is with us. We're going to do okay. We're going to survive. Don't worry about this. We'll, we'll survive. We'll go back someday. She was dressed in black. She had a, a black cover on her hair as well, on her head. And I was very uh, encouraged by her. I was very surprised that she had so much courage and so much um, strength. And I asked who she was. And I found out that her son was just killed during the first part of the invasion, around the 21st or 22nd of, um, of July. And then I also found out that her other son was killed in 1964 during the uprising of the Turkish Cypriots against the government of Cyprus at that time, something you don't need to know much about it at this point, but there was another conflict with the Turks at that time. And her other son was killed at that time. And then I found out that her husband was killed by the British in 1955 during the uprising against the British. This woman had lost three. Her husband, two sons. There was only one son left that was with her at the time. And she had so much strength and so much courage. She had so much um, ability to give strength to others as well. And then the Saturday, I went to Vesper service. Vespers is one of the most beloved services for me. You're missing out if you're not coming. Vesperus is one of the most beautiful services. Since the time I was a small child, six years old, I've been attending Vesperus almost every Saturday. And that Saturday, I went to church in the village where we were, in Ayanap, in the cave church, an ancient cave church. And that woman, dressed in black and with a black tsemberi cover on her hair, she was there. And during the service, I would watch her doing her cross and bending down and throwing her body onto the floor and doing prostration, prostrations, hitting you know, her whole body onto, and praising God and doing her cross. And I then realized where that woman had all the strength and all the ability to sustain all the pain, it was from God. And it's only through God that we can survive in conditions like this. And that was a big lesson for me. As a child, as a 17-year-old, I turned to God at that time. I turned to God complaining and saying, why did you allow this to happen? And why did you allow our churches to be destroyed? But I also turned to him and I said, I know that whatever it is, you will take care of us. And I trust that you will take care of us. But why did you do that? I haven't gotten a clear answer to the why, although some things I can talk about some other time, I don't want to get into it now. But it was primarily because of our own sinfulness that we opened the doors to this that's another story. But something good came out of it too. We then Gagona Mies Kalu, Elegan the ancient um, Greeks used to say, there's no evil that's not mixed with good. Some good came from it too. I would say that I am a priest perhaps today, and many others as well, because of that experience because of the ability to know that even in the greatest destruction, God is present, that even when everything falls apart, God preserves us, that even when human beings are evil, there is only one place to go, and it is God, and he will take care of us. And I saw that in that woman that day, and it remained in my mind forever. So how can we forgive the Turks? Only through God's grace, only through God's love, only when we are touched by his love can we forgive anyone. And I explained 
that over and over every year, it's a very hard thing for all of us. Only when we allow God to come into our hearts and cleanse us and purify us and we feel his love, can we forgive? And I didn't know if I forgave or not until I went to Turkey. In 2001, I went to Turkey for 17 days. I traveled throughout Turkey with a Canadian group, university group from Calgary. And I knew that I loved those people. They were not very different from us. They were not very different from any, any of us. They are also people. But sometimes the leadership, the governments, the fanatics, those who are aiming for personal um, or otherwise benefits, they rally people to do bad things. And that is the sad part of all of this. But we need to forget, forgive. But we will never forget. It's impossible. This is our lives. And we know what happened. We cannot lie about it. But we have to find peace. And that's the prayer for all of us. Amen.